Very good. Well, again, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, Mike. Um, as I mentioned, this was a difficult week, but uh, it's nice to see you virtually. And um, so you, everybody can hear me okay? Can you see my pointer on the screen? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. So I want to talk today about um, some questions about string vacuum and the standard model, but let me start first with a little um, brief prologue. So I met Mike at Caltech when I was visiting as a prospective student, I think in 1980, it was, I guess, 88, spring of 1988. Um, so quite some time back. And I have a very strong memory of that because Mike had just bought a new Mazda RX-7, if I remember correctly. And <laughs> we met, we started talking about physics and Mike took me for a drive around in um, Southern California in, in his RX-7. And I thought, wow, this is really cool. This world of strength there is. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I wanted to go to grad school to learn about strength theory and Mike, uh, you know, I've always been very, uh, inspired by Mike's, Mike's uh, adventures in the world of, of string theory. And, you know, at that time, as I was starting as a graduate student, you know, there was like, you know, Ed Witten the, and John Schwartz, the gods of the field who were kind of working at a, you know, very, uh, you know, far away level. But Mike was just a few years older than I was. And he, and he was, you know, a, a real person doing this stuff. So that was very inspiring to me. Anyway, I remember fondly that that visit and, and tooling around in your, in your car, Mike. Um, back then uh, decades ago. I think this picture is not quite that from that era, but it's it's somewhere between here and there. Um, so anyway, you know, since then, uh, Mike has pioneered a lot of interesting directions and um, a lot of his work has inspired a lot of my own efforts over the years. I just want to bring up a particular, uh, you know, a paper that Mike wrote almost 20 years ago, uh, which was part of his pioneering work also with others with, with uh, Ashok and Denef um, on using statistics, uh, ideas of um, you know systematically and statistically thinking about the enormous landscape of string vacuum. Mike was really uh, you know a, a pioneer in this in this direction, and uh, I just want to call it to your attention a couple of aspects of this paper. First, uh, Mike at that point already was affiliated with the IHES, and although his U.S. institutional affiliation has bounced around a couple, a few times over the years. Uh, his affiliation with the IHES there is really the most uh, stable of those of those things. So it's great that you all are, are hosting this event and it's great to virtually be there um, where, where he's been uh, having a lot of his intellectual life over the decades. Um, and in particular, this paper uh, starts by talking about classifying string vacua. And I don't know if you can read, read that on the screen there, but you know, uh, studying the ensemble of string vacua and ending using these ideas, we outline an approach to estimating the number of vacua of string M theory, which can realize the standard model. So, uh, you know, this, this idea is something I've been, you know, fascinated by for quite some time. And, and today's talk is really um, building almost 20 years later on what Mike was doing uh, and still trying to move towards finding a systematic approach to estimating the number of vacua of string M theory, and now I would add F theory, which can realize the standard model. So that's kind of the framing of today's talk. And it's great to be able to present this here at the IHES with Mike, Mike there uh, for, this, for this nice event. Uh, so please, as I talk, uh, feel free to stop me with questions, uh, particularly in this, this virtual format. Um, you know, it'll, it'll enable me to connect more directly with what's going on there if people ask questions. And uh, if I don't quite hear your question, just, sh just uh, shout out. So I'm, I hear you. So I'm going to start by talking um, sort of generally about the F theory approach to understanding the landscape of string theory solutions. Um, just give a general uh, picture of, of this and how this fits into the program that Mike, you know, initiated those, those many years ago, and that, which has been, you know, preceding steadily over the years. It's just, it's a hard problem. So, you know, you, you, you start working on something like this and it, it'll be a while before we're at the end of the path. But, uh, you know, Mike's work here really framed a way of thinking about this that I think has informed people over the, over the time since. So I want to fit this F theory story into that context. And then I have some more de detailed analyses of two new constructions of the standard model using F theory. 
And so I wanna present those and think about them in the context of this global picture of the landscape. So the first part of the talk um, is a bit more of a big picture of what's going on. And then I get into some more technical things um, and I probably have more technical slides than I'll have time to go through. And I know the audience is broad. So I'll try to focus on the uh, important big picture issues. And again, if, if questions come up, I'm happy to uh, delve into those and, and uh, end up spending a little less time on some of the technical stuff, which, which may be more, of a pre more appreciated by, um, by specialists in those particular areas. So, okay, so without further ado, um, F theory is a very powerful approach to thinking about string theory vacua. Um, it's a non-perturbative formulation of type 2B string theory. And, you know, back again, just going back to Mike's uh, abstract here, a, an approach to estimating the number of vacua of string M theory, which can realize the standard model. In order to really implement that program, in my mind, uh, you know, since starting to think about this, uh, you know, 20 years ago, the key thing that we need is a really good global picture picture of the set of possible string vacua. And for many years, people had different constructions and you know you had this Calabi Yao or that Calabi Yao, but we didn't really have an overarching picture of how they all fit together into a big uh, framework. And to me, F theory, the big, one of the biggest values of F theory is that although it is difficult to compute things in specific solutions because of the non-perturbative nature of the theory and the fact that the string coupling gets strong, somewhere in the, in the space of the compactification. Somehow the power of holomorphy gives us a very powerful global picture of the set of string vacua that fit together into the largest set of string vacua we know of, which incorporates through dualities, many of the other formulations like heterotic vacua are really sort of a corner of F theory in a particular duality frame, at least the heterotic vacua that people understand. Um, so F theory really gives us this very powerful global framework in which we can really sensibly start to talk about what is natural, how might we formulate statistics more precisely, um, all those kinds of questions. So basically, what is F theory? It's a dictionary that translates between geometry and physics. So the idea is we take type 2B string theory and we compactify it not on a calabi Yau, with no curvature, but rather on a general compact Kähler manifold like, like PN or you know, some blown up version of that. There's really a huge, as I'll say later, there's a huge class of compact Kähler spaces on which we can compactify the theory. And we then have, a, have to do a non-perturbative compactification. And if, if we're going down to six dimensions, then the space B is a complex surface, a complex two-dimensional space. And if we're going to 4D, we need a threefold. B. And the axiodiliton of type 2B string theory then encodes a fiber which can be interpreted as a kind of auxiliary elliptic curve for each point in the compact space B. And so we have a Weierstrass model, which uh, y squared equals x cubed plus fx plus g, which is a, you know, a simple way of formulating an equation for an elliptic curve. But in this case, F and G are functions or more technically sections of line bundles over the base, either B2 or B3, that encode a, an auxiliary geometry, an elliptic fiber over each point. And this fiber, this elliptic curve, basically a copy of T2 at each point in the base space B, degenerates at certain loci. It needs to degenerate at certain loci if the space is not Calabi Yau, uh, because we need to we want to find supersymmetric solutions and supersymmetric and solutions that solve the gravitational equation. So to solve the gravity equations, we need sources for the axiodiliton. Uh, in, the, in the type 2B language, these are seven brains, um, D7 brains and more general PQ7 brains. These seven brains source the axiodiliton. And in the geometric picture, they are loci where the elliptic fiber or the, the extra auxiliary torus shrinks. And in the beautiful work of Kodaira and Naron in the, in the mathematical literature, these kinds of singularities in elliptic vibrations have been classified in terms of Dinkin diagrams. And the, the beautiful insight of F theory is that those Dinkin diagrams that have been associated in the mathematics framework with singularities of elliptic vibrations 
precisely and naturally correspond to gauge groups, not just perturbative gauge groups like SUN, but also non-perturbative gauge groups like the exceptional groups, E6, E7, and E8. Um, and that geometry can be interpreted in several ways. One natural way is in terms of an M-theory limit, where we have grains wrapping these cycles, which have shrunk to points to form these singularities. And so we have an emergent gauge group from the co-dimension one singularities in the elliptic vibration. And at co-dimension two singularities, like these green loci here, for instance, where seven brand loci cross, we get matter representations. So F theory is basically a dictionary that allows us to take a Weierstrass model, an elliptic vibration, which is a very mathematical object, uh, but which we can think of in type 2b as just an axiodiliton over some base space b, which we're compactifying on, which encodes singularities that give us a non-perturbative gauge group and matter content. So this powerful framework has allowed us to get a very good handle, as I said earlier, on these large classes of string vacua. So a lot of the work on F theory has been built on F theory as a limit of M theory. You take M theory in one dimension lower. So for instance, if you want four dimensions, you take M theory on a Calabi uh, fourfold. I, I should add that for supersymmetry, this total space, the total space of the elliptic vibration is a Calabi Yau. So we are still thinking about Calabi Yau manifolds, but the geometry of the string compactification is not Calabi Yau. The Calabi Yau only emerges when we add this auxiliary torus. So a lot of the work on F theory has started in one lower dimension, for instance, by going to three dimensions and thinking about M theory, which is an 11 dimensional theory, compactified on elliptic Calabi Yau fourfold, and then taking a limit where one of the directions decompactifies, you can define that as a, as a type non-perturbative type 2b theory. Um, the general philosophy of this talk is that I want to take the type 2b seriously, the type 2b description seriously. Um, that is, from the geometric point of view, we have a singular Calabi Yau. And while the M theory picture involves doing what's called a resolution of that, where we make it into a smooth space and then do the physics on the smooth space, that is essentially just a, um, a workaround for the fact that we don't really know how to think about the singular geometries. And one of the things I'll talk about today is, is the fact that some of the physics, certainly the physics is independent of how you do the resolution, but it even seems that there are parts of the mathematics which can be extracted, which are independent of how you resolve the singularities. So I wanna focus on that um, resolution independent structure. The physics, as I say, has to be independent of the resolution and we should be able to develop a systematic way in the non-perturbative type 2B framework of thinking about how the resolution independent physics is encoded in what the apparently singular geometry there. There's some recent other work, um, paper with Sheldon, Sheldon Katz that came out recently where we work on, again, some an extension of some other work of Mike's that he did with uh, uh, Schnell and my former student, Douglas Park, uh, uh, sorry, Daniel Park, um, which was essentially pushing in this direction. How do we understand the, the physics of type 2B um, from directly without having to go through M theory. Uh, so in that work of Douglas Park and Schnell, they understood in eight dimensions how to get the abelian gauge groups coming out of F theory. Uh, and this recent work I just mentioned obliquely here with Sheldon is, is basically taking that other aspect of Mike's work and generalizing it uh, to higher dimensions. Um, the focus of what I'm gonna do today is on the structure of the intersection theory on these singular elliptic calabi which enables us to understand chiral matter and gives us essentially a toolkit for understanding these um, different constructions of the standard model that I'll be talking about. Again, just stop me if there are any questions. So as I've said, F theory is very powerful because it gives us a global picture of a large part of the string landscape. And one of the big puzzles over the years has been, there are lots of calabi can we even show that the number of calabi Yau's is finite and get a handle on that? Um, again, the finiteness of the landscape is a, is a problem that Mike has, has had many contributions to over the years. Uh, he and I wrote a paper actually uh, on one aspect of that. 
Um, but we still don't know whether the number of Calabi Yau three folds or four folds are finite. On the other hand, we know that there are a finite number of elliptic Calabi Yau three folds and four folds uh, that were shown by Mark Gross based on some work of Antonella Grassi for three folds. And for four folds more recently, uh, there's been some nice work also showing this in, in the mathematical literature. Um, so we know that there are a finite number of elliptic Calabi Yau three folds or four, and four folds. And in recent years, we have come up with more and more evidence and stronger analytic arguments that in fact, almost all Calabi Yau three folds and four folds are in fact elliptic. elliptic. Uh, this was found by you know, this group uh, from Virginia Tech, Anderson, Gao, Gray, and Lee have found uh, you know, strong evidence for this among the complete intersection Calabi Yau manifolds. And uh, with my former student, Yu Chen Huang, we, we looked at the kreutzer skarka database of you know 400 million different Turek constructions. And of the uh, Kreutzer, so I think Anderson, Gao, Gray, and Lee found numbers like 99.9% .9 for four folds and 99% 90, for three folds. Uh, looking at the kreutzer skarka database, of the 400 million Turek constructions there, all but about 30,000 admit what I would call an obvious elliptic or genus one vibration in, one, in some phase. So here's a picture of the Hodge numbers of the Calabi Yau threefolds in the Kreutzer Skarka database. And the red points are the Hodge numbers associated with cases where we can't just immediately, by looking at the toric construction, see an elliptic vibration of that geometry. And I suspect that many of those remaining 30,000 will still have um, elliptic vibrations. We just, it would just require some, some more sophisticated analysis to show that. Um, so basically, the point I want to emphasize here is that the set of elliptic Calabi Yau threefolds is bounded, it is finite, and it is very well described. And the same is true for, for elliptic Calabi Yau fourfolds. The classification is less complete. There's a picture which looks a bit like this, uh, which is only a part of what you get even torically. Um, and I'll come back to the question of you know, how many toric even bases there are that support elliptic Calabi Yau fourfolds. Um, but the point I really want to emphasize in the context of this, uh, you know, vision of Mike's from a couple decades ago of, of systematically doing statistics on the string landscape, the, the F theory landscape of elliptic Calabi Yau fourfolds is under better, you know, even though it's, it's complicated, we don't have full control over it, we have a better sense of what the global picture of that landscape looks like, and in particular, how all these different vacua are connected. Uh, I should emphasize that this picture here is you know, some 40, 400 million different uh, cala elliptic Calabi Yau four threefolds. Those are all provably connected through certain kinds of transitions, through Higgsing and tensionless string transitions in the 6D theory from the physics point of view and through uh, geometric transitions on the geometric side. And the same thing is essentially true for fourfolds, although the things aren't proven quite to the same degree of precision. So, we have a big landscape and we have some control over it. So let's look in that landscape to see what we can find for physics that looks like the standard model. That's really the, the top down goal of, of, of this talk and, and some part of my research program and, and you know, part of Mike's vision of this, how, how this might lead us to connect string physics with observable physics. Any questions? Okay, so what do we learn by looking at this big landscape of, of F-theory models? So one of the things we learn, which might seem a little surprising um, from other points of view, is that virtually all of these elliptic Calabi Yau threefolds and fourfolds have a structure which I would refer to as a rigid or a non or geometrically non-higsable um, gauge group, which is basically that everywhere in the moduli space for most of these bases, we are forced to have certain kinds of gauge groups, at least geometrically. From the type 2b point of view, there are certain loci corresponding to so-called divisors in the base geometry, um, where that co-dimension one locus for a seven brain has a negative normal bundle, which essentially forces seven brains to live at those loci and support gauge groups. So this is true for virtually all threefolds and twofolds complex Kähler twofolds and threefolds that support elliptic vibrations. 
And these rigid gauge factors that are forced on us, if we take, say, four dimensions, very similar in 4D and 6D, but my goal here is to get to 4D, so we'll focus on that. These rigid gauge factors include certain gauge groups, like the exceptional groups, E6, E7, and E8, and F4. It also includes some of the classical groups, SO8, SO7, and SU2 and SU3, but it does not include all of them. It does not include in particular SU5, which we often use as a gut group in, in physics. So you might ask, why can you get SU2 and SU3, but not SU5? And the answer is that there are actually non-perturbative realizations of SU2 and SU3 through some of the Kodaira singularity types, which are basically forced on you by vanishing of F and G to some orders in the base. And these, these uh, non-perturbative realizations are possible for SU2 and SU3, but not for SU5. Uh, in addition to single gauge factors, there are also products of two gauge factors. And in 4D, there are only five different products that can emerge with G2 and SO7 and SU3 times SU2 or products of SU2 and SU3. So a typical F-theory geometry, if we go to this you know, big global picture of all these different possible things, a typical global geometry will have a whole bunch of these gauge groups forced on you and they will appear in clusters which are connected to each other through intersections of the seven brains where matter lives and those clusters will then be separated. So you'll have multiple, you know, perhaps a dozen clusters in a given geometry, each of which supports a particular gauge group. And those gauge groups can only talk to each other through gravitational interactions and scalars. So it ties in very naturally to the notion of dark matter, that we have one sector where our SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 lives. And then there are other hidden sectors which only communicate gravitationally or through you know, massive scalar interactions. Uh, so this fits pretty well with the fact that we're having a hard time finding, for example, weakly charged dark matter. If, if, the, if much of the dark matter is hidden in these extra sectors associated with geometrically forced gauge factors, it would fit very naturally with, with what we've seen. So as I say, these, these uh, rigid gauge groups are ubiquitous throughout the landscape. Um, if we look at the better understood case of 60 supergravity theories controlled by elliptic Calabia threefolds. If we again go back to the kreutzer skarka picture, of the, of the 61,000 toric bases that support um, elliptic Calabia, only the generalized del Pezzos, so only about a dozen different bases, and those are the orange points in this diagram, do not support some kind of rigid gauge group. The typical gauge group in 6D is something like E8 to the fifth times F4 to the sixth times 10 factors of G2 cross SU2. So there's a big gauge group with these different factors which are disconnected. And in 4D, the story is very similar. Um, in, in, for 6D, we've done a systematic classification of all of the toric bases that support elliptic Calabia threefolds, and there's about 61,000 of them. It, for 4D, constructions, there are far more, and you can't systematically enumerate them. We've done some Monte Carlo studies, and a good estimate is that there are something like 10 to the 3,000 base geometries. So this is not even including the exponential statistics of fluxes that, that uh, Mike and Frederick Deneff and others uh, studied back in, in the early days of the, the large landscape discussions. Um, but these are actually distinct geometries, something like 10 to the 3,000 even just toric geometries that would be threefold bases supporting um, elliptic Calabia fourfolds. Um, and, and there's a little bit of a question in that counting, which has to do with whether you count different phases of the same or different flop phases differently. And that's, I think, a key question, uh, which I might come back to if I have a few minutes later, uh, for dealing with these questions that Mike and others have, have studied since, since the uh, paper I mentioned of bikes, uh, in trying to understand how to really be systematic about the numbers here. But anyway, in 4D, of those 10 to the 3,000, only about 4,000 are so-called weak Fano bases, which lack these rigid gauge factors. So almost everywhere in the landscape, we've got a bunch of these rigid gauge factors. And so it's a natural way to try to understand what's natural in string theory and what's not. We don't know how to do precise statistics, but here we're talking about something like 
4,000 out of 10 to the 3,000, um, which would be branches of the moduli space where we don't have a forced gauge group. It makes it seem very compelling that the place to look for a realization of the standard model or our observable physics is through these uh, rigid gauge groups that are forced on you from the geometry. Uh, that is, if, uh, of course, what we're, what we're doing in these supersymmetric theories has any um, relevance to non-supersymmetric physics. I, I believe that it does in part because the story is so similar for the 6D theories with eight supercharges to the 4D theories with four supercharges in terms of these rigid gauge groups that are forced on you that I suspect when we really understand non-supersymmetric vacuum of string theory in an equally systematic way, uh, we will also have these kinds of rigid gauge groups forced on us there as well. Okay, so what do we do from there? We have this big picture of what the string landscape looks like from the F theory point of view. How can we realize the standard model in that context? So there are a lot of different choices for how to proceed. Um, I've emphasized this idea that there are these geometrically non-higgsable or rigid gauge groups in the majority of the different geometries. We can also try to directly tune the gauge group. Remember, we have this Weierstrass model, and if the Weierstrass model is such that F and G vanish to various orders, we get what are called what we would call tuned gauge groups, where we choose, we basically um, fine tune a bunch of moduli to get some specific gauge factor. So we can either try to realize the standard model by tuning it through either through tuning a, a unified group like an SU5 or by directly tuning the standard model, or we could go to a, a rigid or non-Higgsable gauge group and try to realize the standard model as a subgroup of that. Again, I emphasize the geometric and the non-Higgsable because of course a standard model realized in that way will still be Higgsable through the standard Higgs mechanism along with supersymmetry breaking. The, the non-Higgsability here really is a geometric non-Higgsability related to the rigidity of the geometric construction. So we can imagine using a uh, rigid or non-Higgsable gauge group to directly tune the standard model, or we could get the standard model from a gut, but where the gut is realized through one of these rigid gauge groups, which would then have to be something like E6 or E7 or, or E8 instead of SU5. So the first construction I will talk about uh, of the specific constructions today is a class of models where we directly tune the standard model gauge group without a unified group in the context of F theory. So that'll be construction one that I'll get into in more technical details of in a few minutes. Um, the biggest body of work, uh, starting with the work of Beasley, Heckman, Waffen, and Danagi Weinholt uh, quite some years back, was focused on tuning a gut group like SU5, that is not having a rigid gut group because you can't have a directly a rigid SU5, but having a tuned SU5 and then breaking that through fluxes down to a standard model gauge group. Um, but it, from this top-down point of view, however, as I've been emphasizing, these tuned models in several senses are rather rare in the landscape. On the one hand, they require tuning many moduli. If you have a given geometry, you have to tune many of the complex structure moduli to get these gauge factors. Uh, and they're rare in another sense, which is that most of these bases are kind of chock full of these rigid gauge factors, and that doesn't leave much room for tuning further gauge factors. So there has not been a systematic study of this, but uh, my general sense is that it will be very hard to find typical Calabi Yao threefolds or fourfolds with large Hodge numbers uh, where there's enough room to tune either an SU5 gut group or even a directly tuned standard model gauge group. Again, that's an interesting project for further work, but, but I, I think that's, it's certainly easier to imagine getting things with the uh, rigid gauge factors. We can get the SU3 and SU2 as a rigid gauge factor, as I've mentioned before. Sorry, was there a question? Uh, but it's difficult to integrate the U1 factors. So a natural approach is to try to take one of these rigid gut groups, Sorry, is there a question or am I getting a little echo? You are the gonna echo, I think. Okay, great, I'll ignore that then. If there is a question, just shut up. So the second construction I'm gonna talk about today is one where we take a ubiquitous rigid gauge group, in particular E7 or E6, and we use fluxes to break that to get the standard model. So this is kind of the broad context, the F theory picture, which gives us this 
better handle on the global structure of the string landscape. And what I'm going to do now is dig into a little bit more in detail how we actually get these different kinds of standard models. Um, so this is a good, a good um, point to stop for any questions at this stage of the big picture. Any questions? Okay, merrily we roll along. So let me um, now turn to a slightly more technical aspect of the talk uh, and give a little interlude on a, a mathematical piece of structure, which gives us a powerful set of tools that will enable the two constructions I just talked about. So this is some work that came out with uh, Patrick Jefferson, who's a postdoc at MIT. Uh, Patrick is, is fantastic, and I think we'll be looking for jobs in the fall, so I urge you to uh, consider him. And Andrew Turner, who's a former student who's now a postdoc at UPenn, um, also an excellent physicist. So um, with these guys, we recently put out a paper where we systematically looked at what seems like a technical issue, the middle cohomology on elliptic Calabi-Yau fourfolds, and basically the upshot of this is that we have a way of describing this middle cohomology and in particular the middle the intersection on the middle cohomology, the intersection form on that middle cohomology, which streamlines and simplifies understanding how chiral matter works and also how fluxes work in four dimensional F theory models. So this is a subject which has been studied very richly and I'll give some references in a few minutes, uh, but in general, the tools were applied in a sort of case by case fashion and I think, I think what I'm about to describe gives us a nice uh, unifying framework for doing a lot of these calculations. So in order to talk about this, we need to say a little bit more about the topology of elliptic Calabi-Yau fourfolds. So as I mentioned, divisors are co-dimensional one, algebraic threefolds living in a fourfold. For example, the seven brain loci are two-dimensional divisors in the three-dimensional complex base. And there's a relationship. So basically the number of divisors, the dimension of the space of divisors is, is given by the Hodge number H11 of a complex variety. And the H11, the Hodge numbers of the H11 Hodge number of the elliptic Calabi-Yau three or four fold by a, a nice result of Shiota Tate and Wazir is given by the H11 of the base plus the rank of the gauge group plus one in physics language. So basically, what this means is that the divisors in the Calabi-Yau threefold or fourfold can be broken up into, and I'll, I'll use this as an indexing structure. There's a zero section. I don't think I mentioned this, but the elliptic vibration structure requires not only a, a torus over every point, but also a section of that elliptic vibration. So there's a, a section called the zero section, which is a divisor in the total space. There are divisors, which I'll index with an alpha index, which are pullbacks of divisors on the base. That corresponds to this H11 part of H11 of the base part of H11 of X. There are Carton generators, and these are the divisors that are associated with the resolution of the singularity. So when we go back to this picture of the Calabi-Yau um, as an elliptic vibration, when we resolve the singularity that gives us, say, an SU3 gauge group, there's an A2 Dinkin diagram there, and those curves there fibered over this divisor in the base are what give us the Carton divisors of the gauge theory in the Calabi-Yau construction. So those I'll index by a DI. And then if we have multiple U1 factors um, relevant, uh, for example, for, for the story of Douglas Park Schnell that I mentioned earlier or other things where we have multiple U1s, uh, we'll index those by an A, although nothing I'm gonna do in my talk today involves extra U1 factors. So um, or, or little, uh, sorry, that's not true. Uh, some of what I'll say will involve extra U1s, but not too much. So collectively, we use a capital I index and denote these. And I'll just note that the non abelian gauge factors of the model are supported on a divisor, which is a sum, slightly unfortunate notation here. The first sum is a sigma. The second sum is a coefficient, sigma alpha, uh, d alpha. So <laughs> two different meanings for that sigma alpha. Um, Okay, so that's some notation. So in general, the calabi fourfold will of course have other Hodge numbers. H31 is the number of complex structure moduli. Generally H21 is small. 
H22, which we'll be interested in, is related by an identity to the other Hodge numbers, as is the Euler character. So we're interested in H22, the, the 2 2 cohomology of this Calabi F fourfold. And to understand fluxes in chiral matter in F theory, we're, we're interested in a particular class of ver vertical cohomology, of, of cohomology classes characterized vertical cohomology, which are basically generated by the intersection forms of divisors. Uh, in, so, um, at least in, in the Poincare dual uh, picture. So, we want to look at if we take uh, two divisors and intersect them in a fourfold, the divisor is a threefold. So the intersection of two divisors is a surface. So we have a set of surfaces, which I'll denote SIJ, which are in the vertical homology. And these SIJs for different I and J indices are not all linearly independent. There are homology relations uh, that give us linear dependencies. So there's a subset of those. But taken together, those SIJs generate the vertical homology. And this vertical H22 lower is the vertical cohomology, which is point Poincare dual to that. So the vertical homology and cohomology are relevant to us because if we want to understand chiral matter or fluxes in F theory, uh, this is where these things live. So fluxes in the H22 vertical part of the, the four, four cohomology of the fourfold generate chiral matter. Um, so in general, the H4 of a fourfold has an orthogonal decomposition into three parts. There's the vertical part, which I've just been describing. There's the so-called horizontal part, which has to do with deformations of the complex structure. And then as was gradually understood in part driven by the physics of this, there is also what's called a remainder cohomology, H22 rem. Um, and then there's the unimodular intersection pairing on this whole thing. So what we're focused on today is the, inter is the inter intersection pairing on H22 vert. That is, if we take two uh, surfaces, SIJ, what's their intersection form? Or in the Poincaré dual picture, if we take two vertical two two uh, forms, what is their intersection? So this is important to understand chiral matter. Um, so flux in a 4DF theory model, if we think about it in the M theory picture, it's given by an element of H4 of X Z, and it was shown by Witten, this is shifted by something which might be half integral depending on the second Chern class. We won't worry too much about that. If we impose supersymmetry, the flux has to satisfy certain conditions. It needs to live in H22, and it needs to satisfy a primitivity condition with respect to the Kähler form J. There's a tadpole condition, which says that the integral of G wedge G uh, contributes to a an M2 brain tadpole, um, which the total of that tadpole has to match the Euler character over 24. And so we want to find the fluxes that satisfy these conditions. And you know, these are the fluxes that, that uh, Mike and, and Frederick, Mike and, and, and Denef and, and, and Ashok and others, uh, quantify when thinking about counting vacua of string theory. Um, here we're doing it in F theory, and we want to satisfy conditions of Poincaré invariance to give us a good four-dimensional super, super gravity background. That requires that the G flux integrated over certain surfaces, S0 alpha and S alpha beta, again, where alpha is a base index, have to vanish. And if we want to preserve the original gauge group, we need to have G integrated over SI alpha, where again, I is a carton uh, to vanish. So when we want to break E7 by fluxes in the second construction I'll talk about today, we will take that to be non-zero. Uh, so basically, as I said earlier, chiral matter is determined by fluxes through vertical cycles. So in a given representation, the chiral matter index in that representation is given by integrating the flux over a so-called matter surface SR. So the problem of understanding gauge symmetry breaking uh, through this equation and chiral matter through this equation boils down to understanding the intersection form on the middle cohomology, on the vertical middle cohomology of the Calabi F fourfold. Okay, so this is what we've been studying. Um, again, previous work on chiral matter tended to use explicit resolutions. But basically what we do, what we have 
have done in this in this work with Patrick and Andrew is to think of the fourfold intersection numbers M I J K L, uh, which in principle and and in fact depend upon the resolution that you choose of the singular elliptic Kolebiya four, and organize them as a matrix where the indices of the matrices are pairs of indices. So for instance, M I J K L, which is the intersection between S I J and S K L, can be thought of as a matrix in this space of two two vertical surfaces. We then have an equation for the fluxes theta ij coming through the surface sij integrating g through sij, which can be written as this matrix times a vector, where this vector phi kl basically encodes the flux through Poincaré dual surfaces. So the idea is we're reformulating this whole story in terms of linear algebra and a matrix so that we can manipulate things in a fairly simple and straightforward way. If we remove the null space associated with trivial homology elements, then this matrix M, which again depends on the resolution, um, at least the entries depend on the resolution, removing the null space gives us a non-degenerate intersection form, which I'll call M red or M reduced. And the observation uh, leading to a conjecture is that this M red is resolution independent in every case we've looked at. Um, up to a basis choice. So that if you take two different resolutions and you compute the M red, they are equivalent under an SLNZ transformation. And we've seen this again in large classes of examples and we can show it with a general argument uh, where we only really need to make one assumption about uh, basically where something lives in the, in the root lattice, in the weight lattice rather of the, of the group. Um, so the general form of M red, is roughly the following. Um, for if we just have a simple non-abelian gauge group G and we look on a certain basis, we can write this M red in terms of intersections on the base, where K here is the canonical class of the base, the D alphas are the divisors associated with um, divisors on the base. And then there's, uh, this is the, in, the kappa here is the inverse Carton matrix of the gauge group. Sigma again is the divisor carrying the gauge factor. And then that gets dotted into the Ds. And after we do a non-integral change of basis, again, these are all the same with these asterisks being undetermined. They're all related to each other for different resolutions under linear transformations, or under a non-integral change of basis, we can diagonalize that last part. And this then encodes the physics of chiral matter and fluxes. So in all the different constructions that we look at, this is essentially the form of this reduced matrix. And having this resolution independent form allows us to very readily do calculations with just understanding the geometry of the base and the gauge group and a single computation of this, uh, this M phys part so that we can compute things like the chiral matter spectrum and um, the flux breaking of different things. So, you know, for an example, one that has been studied extensively in the literature uh, from different points of view, from this reduced matrix M red, we can write that the uh, theta three three flux, one of the components of flux, is given by this intersection product times a linear combination of the of the fluxes phi, relating that in various ways, either through matter surfaces or connecting to three D Chern Simons couplings uh, to the chiral multiplicity. We get that th th that this flux term controls the multiplicities of the five and ten representations of SU five. And so we can just read off a base independent formula for the chiral matter multiplicity in, in an SU5 theory in terms of the geometry of the objects on the base. Um, you know, so for example, if the base was P3, then the multiplicity of matter is uh, four times five N minus 24 times M where M is an arbitrary integer and N is the uh, choice of divisor, oops, sorry, on which the, um, <coughs> on which the group is resting. So this gives us a very general way of constructing um, F-theory constructions with chosen gauge groups and analyzing them in a very general geometric way. So let me now just uh, fairly briefly describe the two different constructions that I wanna tell you about. One of them is a universe tuned standard model structure uh, with again, Patrick and Andrew and also my former student, Nikhil Raghuram. Um, let me just say a few words about what I mean by, by universal engineering. So um, 
in F theory, there's a notion of genericity for the representations of matter associated with a given gauge group. So in particular, if we take some gauge group like SU5, SUN, SU3 cross SU2 cross U1, and we construct an F theory model with that gauge group, there are various different kinds of representations we can get depending on what kinds of co-dimension two singularities we have. Those different constructions will have different dimensionality in the moduli space. And so what we would call the generic matter is the matter which occurs on the branch of the geometric moduli space with the largest dimension. And it turns out this notion of genericity matches with the simplest singularity types in F theory. You really have to stand on your head to get more exotic kinds of matter in F theory. You have to get very complicated singularities which, which go outside some of the more simple uh, understood classification of singularities. So for example, for SUN, the generic matter is the fundamental, the two index anti-symmetric and the adjoint. Interestingly, if we take SU3 cross SU2 cross U1, based on the Lie algebra of the standard model, the matter of the standard model is not even close to being generic. In particular, that generic matter doesn't have anything which is charged under all three gauge factors. On the other hand, if we take the standard model gauge group to be SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 mod the simple of six, then the standard model matter plus a few exotics are in fact generic. So for a given gauge group, generic matter is in some sense typical in that you live in the largest branch of the moduli space and anything else is fine tuned. So I'm gonna focus on uh, generic matter. Uh, there's some subtleties in that story, but I'm gonna skip that. So with that notion, we can talk about sort of a universal G model in F theory, which is a class of Weierstrass models where we do the minimal amount of tuning needed to get that gauge group G. And so in general, that will give us generic matter and some high dimensional class of Weierstrass models with the chosen G. So for example, the famous Tate models or the Morrison Park model for U1 are examples of universal models for a particular gauge group. And uh, with Raghuram and Turner, we identified uh, based on unhigsing a somewhat exotic model that Raghuram had written down for a U1 theory with charges one through four, we managed to identify the universal Weierstrass model giving us the standard model gauge group, by which I mean three, two, one mod Z6. Um, so we have this very complicated looking Weierstrass model. If you've studied F theory and you're familiar with like the Tate models or the Morrison Park model, this is sort of another example of that. Those parameters are choices of polynomials or sections of line bundles on the base. And so this is a very high dimensional parameter. We've, we've, we've got a high dimensional number of parameters parameterizing this universal virus cross model. And we can check that it has the correct number of parameters needed by anomaly cancellation so that we have all the uncharged scalars you might expect. Um, a special case of these is the so-called um, F11 um, standard model constructions, which have recently been used extensively by the Penn group in their constructions. Okay, so for these models, we have three families of anomaly-free generic matter. There's the MSSM matter, and then there are two families of exotics. And in a hopefully soon to appear paper with um, Patrick Jefferson and Andrew Turner, we take this general Weierstrass model and analyze chiral matter in that model using this uh, resolution invariant structure I described. And we, fact, and we find that you can get all different, all three families are possible. There are no constraints on what families are allowed beyond anomaly cancellation. Um, and we can write down a closed form formula for the chiral multiplicities. So for example, again, on P3, here's a formula for the chiral multiplicity of the three, two, one, one, six matter. It's given by, you know, here N2 and N3 encode the divisors that support the SU2 and SU3 factors and phi is a flux. So this gives us a very general construction of a huge class of standard models. Um, starting to get to the point that we can sensibly ask questions like those Mike was asking in his 2003 paper. How can we do statistics now really having a global picture of what's the set of models? Where can we tune this? And what kinds of fluxes can we turn on and start to analyze those models in more detail? I'll just mention that a year or two ago, there was a paper by the Penn Group, Svetich, Halverson, Lin, uh, and with other papers with Liu, Tian, and Long. Um, looking at the so-called F11 model, they had a paper where they had a, a quadrillion standard models where they had a quadrillion constructions that led to a standard model-like thing. 
that's a very special case of this broader class of constructions we've got here. So very large class of constructions. Okay, but as I said earlier, this is great, but it's tuned. So if we really wanna find something typical or generic, we should break one of the non geometrically non-Higgsable exceptional groups. So in a recent paper with uh, Kobe Shengyan Lee, student at MIT and another paper forthcoming shortly, um, we have outlined a construction where we take E7 as a rigid or geometrically non-Higgsable group and break it down to the standard model. So again, remember, we were thinking about through this kind of unifying resolution independent picture, the flux as being this matrix times the flux phi. And when we have non-zero theta I alphas, that will break some of the Cartan generators, breaking the gauge group down. So one simple thing to do is just to take an E7 and choose fluxes that break the I equals three, four, five, and six. And that gives us an SU3 cross SU2. Furthermore, generally there's a residual U1 factor and you can get different numbers of U1 factors depending on the fluxes, but we can do this to preserve one U1 factor. Typically, if we do this, we get some exotics. So we can either do this and have exotics and say, look, we've got the standard model plus exotics, or we can go one step further and say, let's choose the fluxes so that the U1 is essentially the U1 hypercharge, and then we don't have exotics. On the other hand, so this is actually a provably a unique up to automorphism, this embedding of SU3 cross SU2. If we do choose a U1 that corresponds to hypercharge, then somewhat, you know, everything comes together and you get another non, you get another unbroken non-abelian factor. So you actually have an SU5. So to get the standard model without exotics, it seems that we want to first do a flux breaking down to SU5 and then use a more exotic mechanism called um, hypercharge flux breaking, which requires a slightly more complicated geometry to break the SU5 down. Uh, and this is actually the mechanism, the, the breaking of SU5 ends up being the mechanism that was used in this earlier work I mentioned on the tuned SU5 models. So the idea is we first use vertical flux, which is what I've been describing most explicitly to break E7 down to SU5. And then we use what's called remainder flux breaking. That is we're now using cohomology in the remainder part of, I told you about the vertical plus remainder plus horizontal H4 decomposition. We're now using remainder flux, which is a subtle beast. It's been studied by uh, various groups, Brown, Cullen, Ishii, Valandro, probably most extensively. You need to find a divisor sigma in the base, which contains a curve, which is non-trivial in that divisor, but which is homologically trivial in B. And you can't do that if your base is toric, but oh, you can't do it uh, with a toric sigma if your base is toric, but you can do it on a non-toric base. Um, so you have to go to a slightly more exotic construction, but you can do this. And then you get a, a theory with only the standard model matter. So just a very simple example. I got only two, I'm gonna stop in two minutes. So let me just say a couple more things. One simple example is if we just look at the SU5 part of the construction, we take the base B to be a certain variety of P1 bundle over the Hirzebrook surface F1 and a sigma to be a certain section of that. We look at a particular geometry, we have to solve uh, the primitivity condition, we have to solve some constraints in the Kähler cone, which tells us that the fluxes we turn on have to be, have basically um, opposite signs, small integer fluxes. And we can then compute the chiral index, which is seven times one integer plus four times another integer. And then we note by the tadpole condition that the number of possible directions in H22 is much bigger than chi over 24, which means that typically in any given direction, the flux will either be zero or some small non-zero value. So there's kind of a minimal solution to the equations that allow us to get a good construction, which is that one of, the flux, one of these numbers in is one and one is minus one. And when we turn those numbers on, we exactly get three generations. So this is just one example, but the point is that the, the analysis of these models gives us constraints on the chiral matter multiplicities, which are naturally linear combinations with small integer coefficients of integers. And that can very naturally lead to three as a somewhat minimal solution. Um, I have some details on a more exotic uh, construction where we really use the CRAM curve. I won't go through that. Um, let me just summarize the features of this construction. So this is a ubiquitous construction. It's possible on typical bases. 
based on these Monte Carlos, it looks like something like 20% of the base three folds have a rigid E7. It allows us to break E7 as a gut, even though E7 doesn't have its own chiral matter, we get chiral matter after the breaking. There's a little bit of technical details I didn't have time to go into there. Um, we don't get chiral exotics if we go through this breaking pattern with an intermediate SU5. Um, similar construction is possible for E6 and it's more complicated. Okay, so let me conclude and come back to the overall questions. We've got this approach to understanding resolution independent intersection forms on H22 vert, which sounds pretty technical, but it allows us to construct uh, a, a variety of new models, including uh, these universal GSM models where we can compute the chiral matter and these models where we break E7 down to SQ5 down to the standard model. So now we have a global picture of the F theory landscape and a number of very different ways where we can get the standard model. So I wanna come back to Mike's question from the paper that I put the abstract up at the beginning. Can we now take this and formulate an intelligent and informed statistical framework for really considering in detail the relative merits of these different constructions and identify what is natural as beyond the standard model physics, assuming say that there's supersymmetry, we're doing everything here with a supersymmetric extension of the standard model. Um, but this basically I, I feel is trying to make concrete the vision of Mike's of setting up a framework where we can really think about what is typical and what's not. And one thing I wanna emphasize is the fractions here are enormous. So even if you don't have a perfect handle on your statistics, if you have two constructions and one of them can happen in 10 to the 3000 ways, and one of them can happen in 4000 ways with no exponent, that's an enormous ratio that is very hard without some physical principle to imagine evading the conclusion that the by far more prevalent system will dominate. It's just like, you know, the gas in the room there is very unlikely to end up all in a corner suddenly. And so we just do statistical physics based on typical notions of average things. And I think we're really getting to the point where we can um, start to ask these questions more intelligently. So with that, I wanna say happy birthday, happy 60th birthday, Mike. Um, and since I think I'm the last speaker, I'd also like to thank the organizers for um, putting together this, this celebration for Mike's birthday. Again, I'm really sorry I'm not there in person, but happy birthday, Mike. And uh, thanks for giving us all interesting things to think about. We have any questions? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Lonnie. Uh, that that was really an excellent uh, talk. It's amazing how far you've come with this uh, question. Uh, I, I look forward to, like you say, try to come up with some interesting, uh, at least you know, quasi-real world uh, statements from derived from this stuff. Uh, just one check of this claim that this is a, you know, a, a very large fraction of, of what could be out there. Is it, is it known how that original uh, heterotic uh, manifold on the Tian Yang manifold, that type of construction can be realized in F theory? Good, that's a good question. So, so I had a phone ringing for part of that. The, the heterotic, let me say a little bit about heterotic actually first where I can say something intelligent and then I'll just punt on the rest of it. Um, when, when I say that the heterotic vacua are mapped to a small subset of the F theory vacua, basically the head, if we take a general heterotic vacua on a calabi threefold, as I've argued, most calabi threefolds are elliptic. So it's the only the elliptic ones where we have a clear F theory dual. But because it seems that most of them are elliptic, I would say that the lion's share of heterotic vacua are on elliptic calabi threefolds, which can then be mapped to F theory models on basically P1 bundles over that same, um, if we take a heterotic model um, with a given threefold, we can, we can map that to a, a P1 bundle uh, base F theory model. Um, the more general heterotic like models with like Tian Yao that you mentioned, um, in particular um, things with some, these, these are things with some H flux, right? And uh, they're, they're non, well, yeah, they're non calabi yeah, but well, yeah, that's right. It's a, it's a two zero model under your language. That's right. It has a non trivial vector bundle. Right. Um, that's a good question. I think there's been a little bit of work on some. I mean, I think um, Dave and collaborators 
have done a little bit of work ma matching some of these. As I, as that was more on the non-geometric uh, framework. I don't, it's a great question. And I don't really know how to fit those in, in this context. Um, I'm optimistic that there will be a way of doing that, but I haven't thought heavily about that. It's a great question. Thanks. Let's talk about that next time we're in the same place at the same time. Another thing is how to fit G2 into it, actually. Uh, I mean, there's been some work on matching G2 to uh, F theory. And actually, uh, just briefly, you know, finding a way of really understanding how to go back and forth between G2 constructions and F theory, I think, would be a huge uh, progress because we don't really understand non abelian gauge groups very well in G2. And it would be great to see these same kinds of rigid gauge groups popping up. Um, I know Sakura. Schaefer Nemeke and Andy Brown have done some preliminary work in this direction and hint at seeing the same kinds of, of rigid gauge groups in G2. But I think that would be that would be a, a, an important thing to really nail down um, to understand whether we're really all looking at the same thing or whether there really are differences between these different approaches. Yeah, so I'm not in let me let me draw back a second. In six dimensions. I have a great level of confidence in F theory because we have a close matching between what we can get from F theory and what's allowed from low energy physics modulo some funny swampland type models that we don't know if you can get in string theory. But basically F theory can get you almost everything that you think you should be able to get in terms of N equals one 60 supergravity theories. Um, it's not as obvious in four dimensions that it covers the space as completely, but it does so well in six dimensions that I have a hard time believing that we don't, we won't be able to extend or or uh, connect the theory with these other things like G2. Does that address your question there? Yeah, 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 thanks. Great. Yes. Oh. <clears throat> I have, have uh, several very naive questions. Sure. Can you get something exotic like nine gauge groups? Like, 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 like sorry, what gauge groups? Like E9. Ah. The problem with something like that is, okay, so this is actually tied into some difficult questions in F3. I think E9 gauge group will not work because that would entail it encoding a, a singularity that goes beyond the Kodaira table, and it would be in some sense that infinite dimension in moduli space. Now, that's kind of related to a, a problem that we don't have a clear answer to, which is that Sometimes it could, so that, that would give you what's called a four six singularity, which goes outside the Kodaira classification. We could try to look at co-dimension two singularities that are of four six type. And it seems that there are some exotic types of matter that may be realizable at these four six points that we don't really understand geometrically from the F theory point of view, but in some cases there may be a heterotic dual, which does make sense. And this is an open problem actually, um, is understanding what happens at co-dimension two and higher four, six loci? You know, another aspect of this is there can be super conformal field theories coupled to the gravity theory at those loci. And there's, there are a lot of open, interesting questions in that regard. I don't think we'll get an E9 gauge group, but I think doing the some similar things at co-dimension two can give us exotic matter and is at the boundary of our understanding. And, and there's lots of, I mean, let me even say one more thing about that. I gave you a construction for E7, which generalizes to E6. E8 is more prevalent in the landscape of these rigid gauge groups. So of course, what I would really like to do is break E8. Um, there was one paper by, by Wong and Tian that made some progress on this. The problem is that the E8s have these, ha only have uh, extra singularities like matter at co-dimension two low side that are four six. And we really don't understand how to treat those. These are some kind of, non-perturbative physics coupled to gravity. In some cases, they're super conformal field theories, but we really don't understand them well enough to, to understand what that physics looks like or whether we can sensibly build a standard model based on that. So that's kind of at the frontier of the F-theory research right now. Yeah, you said you had multiple questions? Yes, yes. Um, so in, in a lot of classification tools which you used, uh, in, in, were more or less classical algebraic geometry. So in, in topology, yes. classical topology, so like in, in, in variance, like cohomology, algebra numbers, intersection. Um, you know, but do you think that more refined invariants of, uh, let's say, four manifolds, if, if in, in case of the six dimensional simplifications, would play a role and, and may actually reduce landscape in some, in some way? 
Yes, and actually, in particular, the thing I talked about in terms of the resolution independent intersection form of middle cohomology, that sounds like a classical algebraic geometric object, but the point is that I'm arguing that this should be a sensible construction even for singular varieties. So for a singular Calabia fourfold, there should be a singular version of intersection theory that gives us this. And I know mathematicians have made some progress on intersection theory and Hodge theory for singular manifolds, but at least as far as I understand it, it's not a completely understood topic. And I don't know, for example, how to mathematically compute this intersection form on middle cohomology that we are identifying from physics as a resolution independent object directly from some kind of, I don't know, I think it was like a rescue McPherson intersection theory on singular varieties. Um, you know, I, I don't know how to connect those dots. And I don't know if the math, I don't think that the mathematicians have that more refined version of cohomology intersection theory working at a level that we can use it yet. So, so very much, I do think that the development of the mathematics, particularly for singular manifolds, and this is also relevant in the G2 case, that you have to go to singular G2 manifolds to get non-abelian gauge groups. So one place where I think a lot of uh, exciting development may be relevant in the mathematics side is, is this kind of more refined intersection theory and other structures for singular varieties. No, but that's going kind of in the opposite direction. You're talking about more and more singular spaces so that, that, that you're trying to move away from geometry. I'm asking, what if you're, but if it's smooth, but uh, like if you have exotic, exotic smooth structures, which are ah yeah, sorry, sorry, I, I misunderstood. Um, I don't. Yeah, it, I, I suspect that when we get to, I think there have been a few papers on exotic smooth structures. It may particularly be that when we go to non-supersymmetric theories, we have to understand yeah. those things a bit better. With supersymmetry, we're in kind of in this nice algebraic geometric framework where everything is analytic and we don't have to worry so much about these kinds of exotic things, I think. Um, but that's a great question. I wish I understood non-supersymmetric theories better. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Rajiv. Yeah.